on to the main event. The main character of Madeline Hendry's first novel is a Princeton grad who leaves school to work as an analyst at a top tier bank and dreams of quitting her job to start her own yoga practice. This is nothing like Madeline's own life. She graduated from Yale, uh, worked in investment management at Goldman Sachs, and now writes incredible novels for a living while running a yoga Instagram. But we are here to talk about Madeline's latest novel, The Love Proof, which Madeline herself describes as a book about the love that endures after a relationship ends. In conversation with Madeline tonight is Jessica Ambrose, um, who graduated from Boston College with a BA in communications focused in radio and television. She's worked in radio from coast to coast in California and Connecticut. And most recently, she hosts a radio show, Lunch on the Deck, on 92.1 FM, WLNG, and Sirius XM. Thank you, Madeline and Jessica, for joining us this evening. And now, take it away. Hey, Jessica, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel like this must be the most amazing day for you after all this work. Oh, my God. That's so nice. Thank you. I mean, yeah. seriously, have you been a little emotional today? Um, it's actually been an incredibly emotional day. So I had the idea for this book first in February of 2018. And wow. I'm a full-time writer. This is all that I do. So I spend all day, every day focused on, for the past year, this story, um, caring about the sentences, the commas, uh, the typeface on the cover. And, you know, you work with only a handful of people and then you show it to the world. It's a, uh, it's a very intimate uh, process that comes to an end today, which is really the beginning. Uh, it's the end of the creation, the beginning of the sharing it. So it's been very emotional. And then you get, you know, other people read it and you actually connect with people about the story instead of just uh, creating it. It's really amazing, yeah. <laughs> well, also I would feel like it's like letting go of this little baby that you've been working on for so long. And it's been in like your little secret. And now all of a sudden everybody, I want you to know, <laughs> first of all, the reason I'm doing this with, with Madeline is because I was, shall we call a stalker after the first, <laughs> okay? I wouldn't leave her alone because I just loved it so much. And I just knew you were a writer, but I was like, Oh my God. I mean, we couldn't put it down. We loved it. All my kids loved it. And you then too nice. you were too nice. Oh, uh, well, and then I got this one and I have to say, Christina, I know you're out there. She, <laughs> she literally stole it out of my suitcase the other day when I was at her house. And then today on the beach, two people, you know, were on the beach here and they wanted it. I've been like holding on to it going, no, it's really it's sought after. And now that it's finally out, I'm really happy that everybody else gets to finally read it because it is just as fantastic. I wouldn't say better, <laughs> but it's, people it's, have said awesome. better. it's okay. <laughs> it is. It's really, really good. All right. So I have so many questions. First of all, kudos. All right. Anybody we're in the restaurant business, the radio business, whatever business you're in, the person that you want to get or the the placing that you want to get your best reviews is the New York Times. It happens to everybody. Today, you're on the new and noteworthy list. Yeah, it's so cool. Oh, cool. <laughs> really, yeah. it's amazing, Madeline. All right, so going back, you know how you said, breathe in, cash out. It was, there's quite a bit of your life in it, right? You kind of picked the yoga part, the everything. What in Love Proof, is along your life. I mean, it's so much more scientific and I know. I don't know you have to really know your stuff to be able to write this. Yeah, well, it's it's audacious to try and write about the mind of a genius, um, <laughs> but you gotta take risks, right? So I think that a lot of it comes from my own life. Uh, the story takes place at Yale. So this is a story about a brilliant physicist, Sophie Jones, who goes to Yale, falls in love, and um, essentially tries to prove that the ones we love are always connected to us. And it's a very mm -hmm. romantic driven research question, but it drives her into science to prove what she feels is true inside. So um, it takes place at Yale where I went and I drew a lot of my own experiences there for the setting. And I, that is a lot of, um, so that's a lot of my own life in the story. 
And one of the realizations that she comes to is, although she's a physics prodigy, and the physics world is very interested in her unlocking the secrets of reality and cracking mysteries around time and space, right. she uh, is not interested in prestige. And she reverses um, to follow a much more uh, emotionally driven, humble path. And I think that uh, that is... I don't want to be so um, narcissistic to say that that's something that I've been through, but I did uh, leave the financial world, which um, to some is a very high reward path to be a writer, a full-time writer. And right. so I identify a little bit with that decision to say no to like the power structure of the world that you're in. Right. Uh, so I did, I did draw from that uh, personally and then there are just tons of very personal details about my own life that go into all of these various characters. I do believe that every writer has all of their characters uh, inside of them somewhere. And so um, all of them, they're just, they're little parts of me. And they're like really uh, dumb teenage boys that appear and make these funny jokes throughout. And yeah, I have like a dumb teenage boy inside me somewhere. So um, yeah, it draws very heavily uh, from my own life. And that's something that I actually take uh very seriously is i like my work to be very emotionally authentic and so i try to mine the real flashbulb emotional moments to write about them well that's one of the things you do so well too you talked about the teenage boy the dialogue <laughs> it is amazing how you nail the dialogue i mean it really you did it in the first book you did it again the dialogue is so awesome that you feel like not only is she saying what you would be thinking but it's so natural the way it's written. I mean, is that something that you intentionally work on? Interesting. Well, I think that the secret to great dialogue is you have to let go of all self-doubt. You have to flow. You don't have the intellectual voice editing anything. Right. And I think that I'm able to just completely not doubt myself, um, which is what you do when you take a really enormous career risk and you leave because you think that you're going to write a book. Um, and so that's that's kind of something that I can do is just let go and believe. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So then the other part that was, I was dying to know, you know how she lost herself in the relationship. And I think the mistake for a lot of um I don't know if it's more often for men or women to do this. Actually, that would be interesting to think about. But, um, you know, it's a common mistake that I think people forget. They get into the relationship and all of a sudden, everything in your life is that relationship. Did that happen to you? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think that I've never lost my identity in a relationship. I think and this is my own moral judgment of what happens to her. So Sophie Jones, physics prodigy, uh, she's obsessed with trying to answer the research question, how can we see time? And she's very intellectually driven and gifted and she's fascinated by information and learning about the world. Then she falls in love with Jake and she becomes fascinated by the experience of love. And it's, mm -hmm. this, it's so emotional and it's, I think it's a really beautiful uh, decision that she makes. Yeah. Where she would rather, this is no spoilers, um, it's part of the conceit of the novel, it's, she would rather have the humble, unintellectual, everyday experience of being with someone she loves than chase the prestige of academia. And um, so my moral judgment is I think that's a really beautiful thing. And I think it's a complete loss of ego. And I think that it's admirable. Um, I know that she changes but I don't, I don't view it in a bad way. Um, and I know it's a really controversial subject. And I'm really interested to hear what other people think about this because it's hard to write about a woman who no longer wants to pursue what was her dream. And so right. that's, that's a very contentious issue, um, especially now, but I think it's a very beautiful and courageous thing that she does. So, in this way, like with this relationship versus the relationship of the first book, what would you say is the difference between your characters of the first book and the second? They are very different, but so many common themes between them. Yeah, it's, um, 
I think it's really funny that um, they are so different. So my first book was called Breathe In, Cash Out. And that's a very sassy, fast paced, um, sarcastic, funny book filled with authentic anecdotes about life on Wall Street. And it's um, described as the devil wears Prada uh, meets Wall Street. And then The Love Proof is completely different because it's, um, so it was reviewed in the Christian Science Monitor today and it called it very earnest and sincere. And you can't have like more antithetical um, concepts than sarcastic and sincere. So I, um, but it's just the story that I needed to write and it's who I was at that time. And I need to just honor the story that comes out of me instead of trying to manipulate my career and be like, okay, I'm going to be the sarcastic girl. Like I'm going to be, um, you know, making fun of rich people my whole life. Um, so that was a very drastic, uh, change in genre, but I believe that it was just the story inside me at that time. And I think my life is very different now. So um, I have more space to think. Like I wrote uh, Breathe In, Cash Out while I was working full-time in finance. So I would get up super early in the morning and write and still be at work before my boss, like at 6.30 in the morning. Um, and so I didn't have a lot of emotional space. And I think that comes out in the novel yeah. um, where it is, it's very um, desperate. Uh, and I think I really capture the emotional moment of that work environment. But um, in The Love Proof, there's, uh, there's a lot more feeling. And I think in my life, I had a lot more space to feel because uh, I was a full-time writer. I was like, I'm doing this. I'm going to give it my, my, my all right now. Um, and actually, the way that the, the story went is I uh, sold breathing cash out, left finance without selling The Love Proof, worked on The Love Proof full-time, and sold it before Breathe In Cash Out came out uh, in 2019. And now here it is, came out today. Oh, wow, that's amazing. So that's like backwards kind of. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Did, how did your process change then? Cause that's, so, I mean, it must've been so different to be writing not only full time, but the quarantine and all of that. And how did you, it must be so hard as a writer to be that structured to say, <laughs> you know, I'm going to have one more cup of coffee and then I'm going to sit down and write. <laughs> I mean, I'm a procrastinator, so I can't even imagine how painful the process would be for me. <laughs> yeah, well, I think um, maybe I hear that your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. And I love structure. I love schedules. Um, I was when I was in fourth grade, I made schedules for myself in the morning um, of what my day would be like. So to have, I just have internal structure and um, I brought it to a very unstructured situation, which is, you know, I don't report to anybody. I was a full-time writer. Yeah. And, you know, at the, at the end of the year, I had a full book because I treated it like a job. You know, I showed up every day at a certain hour. I took scheduled breaks. It was very habitual and I just treated it like a job, you know saluted and I just wrote <laughs> so that's that was my approach is treat it like a job and that's something that I hear very successful writers say um, is that you treat it like a job you look for results over the long term you don't only write when you're feeling inspired and you show up every day you put in the work and then at the end of a year you know you you have something to show so I just really uh, it's almost like an athletic approach you just you work out, you write, and um, over time, I think that's where the greatest gains come. Yeah, it's impressive. And you mentioned with um, Cash In and Cash Out you, on your website, you mentioned, what did I do? Breathe In, Cash Out. Um, you don't mind if I change the name <laughs> of your book. Um, the, you mentioned on the website though about the music that you listen to, um, yeah. it's like kind of your creative, right? Your creativity came from the music? Yeah. So um, on my website, which is www.itsmadelinehenry.com. Uh, MadelineHenry.com is taken. Um, she's an artist. She's really talented. <laughs> um, but on my website, um, it, there are two playlists. And so one of them is a mood playlist, which I think completely captures the emotional heart and soul of this story. And it's called The Love Proof. And it's filled with 
songs that I listened to while I was writing. The Sophie references them at certain points. And it's kind of this cool, like, fourth dimension of the novel. And then the uh, other playlist is one that Jake listens to in the book. And so he listens to this playlist called The Classics. And The Classics are um, a bunch of oldies. And uh, he listens to it with Sophie in college. And then it becomes this recurring uh, motif for her that when she hears a song, she remembers Jake. And I love that the playlist is called The Classics because this is the story of a timeless love. And by invoking the classics and music that keep coming back, it speaks to the permanence of this connection. And so The Classics is what Jake listens to. And that's also mm. available to listen on my website. And I just think that's a really cool thing when you, you take things that are in the novel and you bring them to life. I love when other yeah. uh, people do that. Uh, like there was the the rapper Logic, he wrote this book called Supermarket, and he released a bunch of new music to listen to on that day with orders of when to listen to what song. And I don't make music, but I can curate music. And uh, <laughs> so I did that for this. <laughs> I love that though, because it does put you in the mood. I would think also if you were having like a writer's block, if you listen to certain songs, it would kind of help you get back in, right? For I would sure. think. Anyway, sure. yeah. yeah. As I you know, a, I a, like, yeah, I'm, I'm very emotional about writer's block in that I, I adamantly don't believe it's a thing. I believe you just, you just write, like you just show up every day and you write. And I know some writers talk about writer's block, but I'm like, no, you lower your standards and you <laughs> write. Okay. You get the words down. Cause like, that's your job. <laughs> Sorry. I'm really, I'm very passionate anti writer's block. <laughs> that's, good. that's good though. Um, so <laughs> what, um, in your writing process, I know it changed a little bit, but it says in the review distinctly, the review that you got originally just a few days ago, it's called, the book was really unique, mm. but why, why do you think they called it unique? Yeah, you know, it's funny. That was like this word that kept coming in up in all these yeah. reader reviews. I was like, okay, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. because I am a big reader and I didn't think it stood out in, like as a complete complete uh, right angle from the rest of, you know, the romance body of literature. But what I think is that um, it is as intellectual as it is emotional. And I think that uh, something else that surprised me about the reviews is that people talk about how sciencey it is, how much you learn about physics and the universe and the constellations and space and time. And that really surprised me because to me, this is first and foremost, a really emotional love story. And yeah. all everything that you learn is um, through Sophie's research, a really emotional question that's driving her, which is why do I still feel connected to this man? And why, you know, he's not with me in this moment, but I feel that we're connected across space and time. And it's, it's very heart-wrenching and emotional and deep. And everything that you learn is just supposed to, uh, emphasize and accentuate this emotion and so when I and the whole the whole point is her she um, is this brilliant person but she makes this very emotional decision uh, about connection for how to live yeah. her life so I wasn't like oh I, I want to write this really like smart novel about the universe I wanted to write a really deep love story that was uh accentuated by everything that you learned so i think it's not it's not normal that you have um this is what i think about the reviews is it's not normal to have such an emotional love story be so full of information right. um, I think that makes it unique uh and i but it, i think that the information is supposed to make you feel what she's feeling a lot more that's good that's good i love that because i was <laughs> I mean, unique, but I was like, why does that keep coming up? Yeah. Now, honestly, have you always been such a romantic? Ooh, interesting. Um, I I don't think of myself as a romantic, but I I think of myself as like a really serious, structured person. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like I spent a year writing a love story between two fake people, so that's got to <laughs> be like I know and romantic. Um, what are you hoping that the readers take away from this? Like when you think of. Yeah. So I, um, this book, The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna came out recently mm -hmm. and, um, I can't wait to read it. Um, I'm really excited to read it actually. 
Um, and I was reading an interview with her and she was asked the same thing. And her answer is one that I'm going to adopt. And she said, I hope readers deeply feel the novel. And I was like, that's exactly what I want. Kristen, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's why you're so successful. <laughs> um, I'm going to use that, just Madeline, <laughs> at the end. Um, so that, that's my answer. I, I hope people deeply feel it because the whole point is about how it's about a woman who uh, feels a connection so deeply that she changes her whole life and she just tries to understand that connection in more depth. And so I hope people really feel that. And it's, it's great if you learn um, theories about time and space. That's all, that's all interesting. But that's the icing on the cake of just deeply feeling the novel, which is why yeah. I hope people... It's amazing because you do put a, quite a bit of the science part into it. But for somebody who's not a science person, it was interesting. <laughs> like, I found it interesting anyway. Um, so I know the other book uh, was optioned. And breathe and cash out was optioned. What about this one? This one, uh, that process has not started, but I know it's going to be published in German. I found that out today. So I'm excited Excellent. about that. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do a whole German thing. Yep. What about an audio book? Are you going to do that? Uh, yes. Yeah. So there is an audio book available now. And the okay. uh, narrator is this prolific um, narrator. She did Where the Crawdads Sing. Uh, oh. She did Pema Chodron, she did Jodi Pico, um, her voice is everywhere. <laughs> um, and if you hear her, you'll be like, she sounds familiar. Uh, <laughs> so sure, her name is Cassandra, and I was so excited, actually, when I saw her on the list of people, I was like, Cassandra, Cassandra, Cassandra. <laughs> so um, yeah, that, that came out today, I was very excited. Okay, good. All right, and I know we're going to take other people's questions. I was saying in the beginning, too, I was like, we're never going to be able to talk that long. <laughs> All right, um, what's next? Okay, so I have a very specific answer. Um, so my third novel is called Food Fight, and this is uh, my current, uh, what I'm currently working on, and it is a novel about a family of chefs in New York City. And I, my soundbite that I say is that it's where great food meets true nourishment. And so I am some like fourth dimension of the novel that I'm doing is I'm building out this Instagram account for that novel in advance. And ultimately I'm going to show, it's called Food Fight Book is the Instagram. And ultimately I'm going to show pictures of the foods in the book. And it's just going to be like this really fun fourth, dim fourth dimension to the novel. Um, and I, I love food. And so that it just had my third novel just had to be, had to be about it. I can guarantee you, you'll have all the Ambroses once again with that. Oh my God, of course. Old thing. That, of course. That's so fun. Yeah. We're all going to be stalking you, Madeline. I'm really sorry, but that's just. Oh no, way. that's good. That, um, so yeah, for this, for this book, the Food Fight book, I've been like, before uh, COVID, I was uh, shadowing in kitchens and interviewing chefs and um, just fascinated with the actual kitchen world. So that's um, that's the third one. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. When do you think that's going to be? Any time yet? I would hope like next year or okay. the year after. It's like, it'll be the next one. So. All right. All right, good. All right. Well, I still have lots to talk about, but I know we have to give some questions. I'm going to go back to uh, the gallery so I can see everybody before it was a little distracting seeing all the faces. Um, <laughs> Catherine, do you have some questions? We do. I know 30 minutes goes by pretty fast when you're talking books, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. So and I even have some of my own questions for you, Madeline, but I will, I'll let the audience go first. Um, and a reminder too, to ask any questions in the chat box that you have for Madeline or for Jessica, if you'd like. Um, so first question, how different were the two lead characters um, from your first book and The Love Proof when you ended the book compared to what you had, exp oh, excuse me, actually misread this. Your two lead characters in The Love Proof, how are they different compared to what you had expected them to be when you began the book? Interesting. Um, so that has to do with the level of detail. I was, I had the vision for this book very early on. And, uh, the way I write is I know how I want it to end up. I know the arc and I had a very specific vision 
Um, I knew who these characters would be. And so they, the, uh, the souls of them didn't really change. Um, but I added a tremendous amount of depth and detail over the course of the revision process. And um, I've had other, uh, you know, pieces that I've done that have undergone tremendous uh, changes in the main characters. But this, they were, I had the ideas pretty early on. And where does that inspiration come from for your characters, ideas for your books, anything you write about, really? Um, well... I've heard the, the phrase that comes to mind is something that Mark Zuckerberg has said, which is that ideas become clear the more that you work on them. And so um, I have my inexplicable burst and then I just follow the yarn and I keep following. And um, that's, that's, I don't know how, how I write. Um, I really love how you talked about um, treating your writing like a job that you would just pick a time and sit down. Um, and so you've talked a lot about your process um, in sort of this, this talk, um, but how did you come into writing as a job? Um, what was sort of your inspiration for taking that? I mean, you really talk about literature like you are a student of literature. Um, it, it seems like you've done a lot of research into your craft. That's so nice. Um, okay, so I uh, am weird because I always <laughs> wanted to write novels. Like nobody wants to write novels anymore. It's like people want to be TikTok stars. So um, I just wanted to write books. And since I was really young, um, this is a little self-indulgent, but like in third grade, you know, I like write books. Um, and then in college, uh, I started to take it more seriously. And so um, I got an offer to join uh, Goldman Sachs full time going into my senior year. And so I thought, oh, wow, this is my last chance to be a novelist. And so what I did was I emailed the head of the English department at Yale uh, my senior year, and I suggested a new course, which didn't exist, which was that I would write a novel for credit. And he's like, sure. <laughs> so uh, I I senior fall I, in this new course that I sort of created, I wrote a novel for credit meeting with a professor once a week, uh, every week for two hours. And I would write like 50 to 100 pages each week. And he would um, read them and give me feedback. And at the end of fall semester, I had a novel that I submitted for publication. And well, I submitted it to agents and it was rejected everywhere. And so then senior spring, I was like, okay, fine. I'll just do it again, no problem. Um, and so I wrote a second novel, Senior Spring, and I did the same thing, met with a professor once a week for two hours. And then at the end of the semester, I submitted it to agents. And once again, it was rejected everywhere. So then I go to Goldman Sachs, and then I have the idea to write my third novel, Taking Place in a Fictional Investment Banking World. And I was like, okay, and that's, that's going to sell. <laughs> um, and so it did. And um, so the, the long answer to that question is that I uh, really took it very seriously for a really long time and then studied one-on-one -on -one with a professor uh, my last year of college. Um, I actually structured my schedule so that I would only take classes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I would go home and write Thursday through Sunday every week, which is just not a normal college senior <laughs> schedule. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so that's that's what I did. And um, yeah, it's funny. I was listening to an interview with uh, V.E. Schwab. And so she's this prolific author. She just had The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue come out, which, you know, has been a New York Times bestseller since, you know, was born. Um, and <laughs> she said she was she was a published author at 21 and that her 20s were like her 30s. And she's like, when am I going to get my 20s? You know, I was never carefree. I was always like writing and um, like a serious adult. And I, I, that, that I identify not with um, like her body of work, but with that attitude that I just have been writing for a really long time. And um, like a lot of people, you know, they want to be writers and I just kept at it. So has COVID, do you think made it easier to keep that schedule? Have you been writing more or are you still like very stringent with your, like your day to day? Interesting. Um, I, the, the biggest thing actually is that I have let, this is unusual, but I have less alone time now than previously, just because I live with my partner who's working from home. So, um, I, 
I do keep a very habitual, um, like schedule day to day. But previously, I was I was completely solitary in my writing. And so the biggest change for me coming out of the pandemic is I got this like my best friend here, you know, so um, <laughs> that's the biggest change. But I do believe it's very important to keep great to keep good habits day after day. And then you look for the results in the long term. So um, that's that's what's worked for me personally. Great. Well, I'm going to give a little bit more time to let some more audience questions come in. Jessica, do you have some more questions for Madeline? I do. Another question came up from my head. Um, <laughs> but I was wondering, in your family, I notice on this Zoom, I'm picturing, I'm seeing a lot of family and friends. And um, who is your toughest critic? I mean, I know yourself, but in your family, who would be your toughest critic? In my family? It's yeah. Like, who, who in my family? <laughs> like, this person on this call is the <laughs> toughest. Um, <laughs> you know what? I I'm gonna take what is the honest answer to that, which is I'm really blessed to have a really supportive family. Yeah. Not just it's my birth family, but my the family I'm marrying into. Like I, yeah. I my fiance, you know, the Alexons, they're I have two families and they both really, um, they give me incredible support and they just believe in this crazy dream. So no. Do you no. let them read it as you're going along or <laughs> how is that process? Like you, they're like doors, somebody's shaking their head no. <laughs> you know what? Interesting. I, it, when I was younger, I was like, oh, read this, read this. Yeah. And, um, the older I get, the less I'm like, read this because, um, I recently, I saw this uh, chef's table it's about a chef in Savannah, Georgia, and it was tracing her evolution as a chef. And when she was younger, she would go to her business partner and she would say, taste this. And she would wait eagerly for an opinion. And yeah. then as she grew as a chef, she would say, taste this. And she would walk away. Yeah. And I aspire to the latter. And so um, I noticed this in ha my relationship with my amazing agent, Eve, is um, I would be so eager. I would turn in something as soon as I read, as soon as I finished it. Oh, oh my gosh, I can't wait to hear what she thinks. But I really aspire to, um, and I'm working on this like right now, <laughs> um, to make something I'm so proud of that when I turn it in, I know she's going to love it. And I know the emotional journey that it will, it will take her on. So that's, that's how I'm approaching it. That's very cool. All right. And one last thing, your, um, if your movie was to be cast, do you have any ideas? Who would you cast in the love proof? Okay, so I'm I'm really out of touch with like youth culture. And like <laughs> if you showed me a list of the 10 most famous teenagers, I'd be like, I don't know any of these people. So it'd be one of those like 10 really famous teenagers who like mean nothing to me. Um, that's who I would want because I would want to fill those seats. Um <laughs> But I always thought I had a much more developed cast list for uh, Breathing Cash Out when I would have wanted Alec Baldwin to be uh, the dad. Um, yeah. Although I know my dad really wanted to be cast in like anything that I do so that he would have his big break. Um, That's what he needs, his big break. Big exactly. Break. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, for you, dad, get making you an actor, you know. Um, and whenever he's like talks about his acting break, people are always like, you know, that's like a full-time job, like acting, you know, you go to a set, full-time job. And he, he's like, yeah, I could do it. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So nobody as of yet, you haven't thought of. No. And you know, what's funny is I used to jump a lot quicker to imagining the adaptation, but yeah. now I'm really growing into the author identity and I'm just much more obsessed with like the actual written version of yeah. what I'm writing. And I care a lot more about that than I do about the adaptation. I have to say with your descriptions and the way you put a voice to these characters, they aren't, you don't picture anybody else. Like they became people to me when I was reading it. Thank and you. You, really, you nailed it. You really did a great job. Thank so. you. Appreciate it. All right, so we do have a couple more questions coming in now from the audience. Um, so in The Love Proof, you mentioned a statistic that most college sweethearts who reunite late in life or later in life are essentially strangers. You cite statistics to support this. Did this study give you pause as you were writing the book? Um, 
No, that doesn't give me pause. Um, I think that that is referring to the, I don't want to do spoilers, but I think, and I won't do spoilers, but I think that people who reunite later in life with the belief that they may still be compatible, they find that life has intervened and they are tied down to things that make them now incompatible. And so that is the nature of time that although you can be compatible with someone, you are pulled in a different direction with obligations, people, networks, cities um, that make you uh, incompatible. All right. And did the fact that your mom and dad or the, did the fact that your mom and dad met at Yale and fell in love there and got married impact the book in any way? Um, that's interesting. Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I actually didn't. Um, there's, there's none, like, I love my parents. Um, but there, there's none of them in, in these characters. They're just different. They're different people. Um, I think that maybe just personally seeing my parents get married, meet each other so young. Um, maybe that might've influenced me in a subconscious way, but I didn't really imagine them as I was writing this, but that's a good point. Okay. And then on to books. It sounds like you're reading a lot in quarantine. Um, what are you reading right now? And do you have a favorite writer? Um, interesting question. Uh, right now I'm reading the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Um, and I'm, I mean, it's gotten such incredible reviews and, um, I think it just became a New York times bestseller, like three years after publication. So like it, get, it just keeps getting more popular. So I got to read it. Um, so I'm reading that right now. And do I have a favorite writer? Um, I really love Blake Crouch. I think he's really fascinating because he's able to write something that is a thriller, but at the same time it has, um, I don't want to say it has uh, depth, but like it, it has, um, it sticks with you beyond the plot because it's actually questioning what reality is in a way that you, you want to entertain. So I, um, I'm really fascinated with his novels because Sometimes you get a suspense novel where you're just reading to answer a question and then you, you get the answer to the question and the book is no longer interesting. But he, he keeps you turning pages in a way where uh, you're actually questioning the world that you live in because he deals with uh, physics and he deals with memory and time travel in, in a way that is very relevant to um, your day to day. Uh, experience. So I, I really like him and uh, I really respect him. And so I would say he's my, my favorite creator. Interesting. Do you read, do you read really widely across genre? Like I wasn't expecting, I don't know what I was expecting you to say, but Blake Crouch was not, <laughs> was not yeah. it. Do you just read what you find interesting? Do you read to study the craft or do you just like you just try to kind of pick from all genres and keep yourself well read. Um, I read uh, very widely. I believe that that is maybe the best writing education that you can get is reading widely. And I am in part driven by what I find interesting and in part driven by what other people respond to. Um, I'm really fascinated by what is a um, successful book and uh, what do what resonates with people, what sticks with people, what do people recommend? And to find the answers to those questions, you have to read. Um, and I think that the more that I write, the more that I read, the more that I read, the more that I write. And it's just, um, it's a positive cycle. Awesome. So anything surprising about the business of publishing that you found in your time as a writer? Um, yes. Uh, I am surprised. So I used to work in finance and that is a fast industry. And so what nobody ever says, I need this today. It's like always assumed that you need it today. And in publishing, you, nothing is ever needed today. Like it's always, you, like things can wait and there's like this, um, it's, le it's a more relaxed, uh, industry that pays a lot more attention to quality and emotions than speed. And so, um, I was surprised by the, uh, lack of pressure that that, that, that creates, uh, in terms of 
and the, like your delivery deadlines are they're a year in advance and it, you the lead times to things it just takes so much more time you have so much more time so i was really uh pleasantly surprised by that because um instead of being in a state of fear and terror to deliver on time you have so much more space to think and to feel and so i was very pleasantly surprised by that um and I guess I've been surprised by, there's a little bit of like a show business element, which isn't bad at all, it's fine. But it's like, it's a little bit of a show business element where you have like, um, it's sort of like, you know, movie releases and, and book releases, they have more in common than um, I would have expected just in terms of like promotion leading up to it. And, you know, uh, I guess I just didn't expect, I didn't expect that because I was so obsessed with writing. And then you get into the, you learn about like, selling and it's 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 interesting to see commonalities and other forms of art like show business so definitely and then one other question we have coming in from the audience you're a natural marketer something many writers can't do how um does covid change the process of marketing for the better since the ways it changes it for the worse are easy to imagine such as that we're doing this via Zoom and not in a bookstore. <laughs> um, so I think it has really made the book tour for The Love Proof already like so much easier. Um, my book tour for Breathe and Cash Out, it lasted a week and I was um, in like a different state every day for that week and it was very exhausting. Um, I was in like Chicago and then I was in LA and then I was in New York and it was just um, for very, uh, the amount of travel to the amount of impact was like really just proportional. And with Zoom, um, I have like multiple Zoom events, uh, in a row sometimes in like different states. And I just never would have been able to do that. And people wouldn't have known, people didn't know what Zoom was before the pandemic. And now people are, they've like, they, they're like masters of, of the software and we all want to connect with each other because we've all been alone for a year. So um, it's actually just really helped the, um, the book tour. And um, it's uh, also made other things like Instagram lives and Facebook lives more popular. So um, it's, it's actually been helpful for, for talking to people about the book. And speaking of social media and Instagram, we haven't talked about yoga at all. Um, I am obsessed <laughs> with your little yoga. Well, I know that the book, this book is about yoga, but I'm obsessed with your yoga Instagram and all of the like cool poses and Thanks. things that you do to help your book. Um, um, how, how does yoga play a, like, a role in your life? Interesting. So um, when I was working in finance, I uh, loved yoga as this uh, oasis of uh, being slow and paying attention to uh, feeling and moving. And so it was like the only part of my life where I had these, um, I was, uh, it was like an oasis in my financial life. And I developed, I worked on this yoga Instagram, Madeline Henry Yoga during that time. And, you know, I was writing a book about it, a banker who wanted to be a yogi. And um, then I left finance and I was at a point where I could have put more of my energy into yoga or more into writing. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to be a writer. And uh, yoga to me is an avocation. It's just something that I love and appreciate. Um, and interestingly runs in my family. There are lots of yogis in my family. Um, and so it's something that I do for fun. And uh, Madeline Henry yoga is just something that I enjoy. Um, I'm not a yoga instructor, but I am influenced by ideas in yoga like humility, which appears in this book, The Love Proof, and um, the ideas of kindness and um like listening and, and being still, um, those, those influence me personally and those make their way into my writing. Um, so that's the role that it plays. That's great. Um, so one of my final questions um, to kind of start wrapping up here, um, I know we've already talked about books, but I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. Okay. If you were to pick five, five books and I'm going to go with, the, or, okay, you know what? Three, three books. <laughs> I'll, I'll lower the okay, bar. A little one bit. Book. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll just keep negotiating. 
skating back and forth. Um, and I'm going to do the classic desert island scenario. Okay. Three books, desert island. What are you bringing with you? Um, okay. So I'm going to have, I think I know my answer, uh, which is I would bring books about faith and spirituality because that I'm going to need to cope because I'm on a desert island. Okay. Things are not good. <laughs> like, <laughs> alone. Um, so uh, the books that I would bring are the untethered soul by Michael Singer, um, oh, yeah. which uh, I love. And I would bring a course in miracles by Marianne Williamson. Mm-hmm. And um, I would bring maybe the surrender experiment by Michael Singer. So really books that are all focused on an approach to life where you let go of your judgment of situations and you surrender to them. Um, and you surrender to love, you surrender to the universe. And I'm going to need that if I'm on a desert island. Um, so that would be my answer. <laughs> Are there any that you've been reaching for during COVID by chance? <laughs> um, well, I go through phases. And so I was, um, I was really fascinated with uh, faith and spirituality because that plays a somewhat of a role in uh, my third book. And so I went through this, I read The Shack, I read Michael Singer, I read Conversations with God. Um, and I keep coming back to The Untethered Soul. I listened to um, it on audiobook. And uh, it just has, it has some real life lessons that I think makes life uh, easier. (laughs) That's great. Any final questions or thoughts from you, Jessica? No, I'm just so impressed in Madeline. I just hope you keep writing because we are thoroughly enjoying what you produce. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's so nice. And then I am actually going to close out with a to Madeline from one of our viewers here. Um, they were an early reader and reviewer of the story, and she cannot stop talking about it. Romance and enough physics to whet the appetite of this armchair physicist. Um, a wonderful event and so appreciating uh, your generosity and our discussion tonight. So thank you, Madeline and Jessica, for joining us this evening. We really, really appreciate it.